Praise the Lord. Welcome to Apostolic Lighthouse Church. And the reason my smile is usually good is because my wife is right over there smiling at me. That's why. So that's an encouragement. I just want to say hello to everybody on this Wednesday night. Uh, if you think I need to dial it down a little bit because everybody's tired, well, nobody, you know, we should be pretty alert right now. So uh, I don't have a tendency to dial it down. I've been told that before. You know, just need to make it a little quieter on a Wednesday night. I'm sorry, I'm going to make it a little bit noisy on Wednesday night because, you know, the Lord has a lot to get done. And he uses people like me and tools that are on the earth, fivefold ministry, to shake things up and to push things around. I mean, thank the Lord for preachers. Thank the Lord for people that will stand up and speak when everybody else wants to kind of hide their head in the sand. Praise the Lord for that. Glory be to Jesus. I'm thankful for preachers in my life, people who have told me the truth when I needed to hear it. Well, let's get back to the announcements quick, and then we'll get into the message. Um, today is Wednesday, and it's good to see everybody. And uh, this is 30 days to slow the spread. Do not be distracted about the rigmarole that's going on. I think we live in a world where the media is constantly at war with the president. It's just an ongoing thing. And I'm not even pointing fingers on who's guilty or what. I'm just not going to get involved in that. What I will say is this. It does make for confusing feedback. So let's uh, drown down the media a little bit and then let our sensibility come. There was a virus loose in the United States. And we're trying to be quarantined to get this settled. So it looks like May 1st, somewhere around there, we're going to have a plan for working our way back into the workplace. We're going to keep those that are really exposed to the virus somewhat safe, and the rest of us can start moving out into the into the workplace. And let's let's make a decision here that we're going to have an impact on our environment. We're going to be better employees than we've ever been before, better owners, better better owner operators than we've ever been before and really be thankful for what we have. Those are some things about gratefulness that I think we really genuinely need to allow to hit in our lives. Well, I wanted to make an announcement, uh, an important announcement about this coming Sunday. And I'm starting this announcement today. I think I told Cody I would do it tomorrow. I'm gonna have to apologize because mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of roll this out. I think we've got the minutia going, got it right. If I come on tomorrow morning on the update and cancel this whole thing we're planning, it's because something came in the way. And this will also be canceled if it rains. Here's what we're doing. We're planning on having Sunday service in the parking lot of our church. And what that means is for those that can actually come up there, there's some of y'all that it's probably not a good idea to get out of the house and come up to the church. So I'm not expecting everybody to show up. But if you can come and show up at the church, we're going to have ushers there to kind of park everybody we're going to have our musicians on the in the portico. We're going to also have a way to put our music and everything on FM radio to go out to your cars, or you'll be able to roll down the window. Now, we are going to be practicing our uh, correct spacing, and what will happen is you can actually step out of the car and be in your door jam in that area, that three-foot area, but don't go outside of that. We'll have people watching and reminding you. What we don't want is people congregating in a traditional way and, and exposing each other to possible uh, unknown things. So let's. what we're going to do is going to attempt to get together to see each other, wave at the other car, say hello, roll down the window, be able to talk the distance, but really and truly have a worship service together with a relevant message. And I say relevant because there are some things that are not really relevant right now. We want something that actually brings us into a focus on Jesus Christ. Jesus is always relevant. So we're going to focus on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and what we're doing for him. Hmm, that's interesting. I talked about that this morning, that you did not save by works, but because you're saved, you will work. Hmm, that's kind of backwards, but that is true. Because I'm saved, I go to work. Because I'm saved, I do things because I'm thankful. Uh, so there's a lot to be thought about there. So that service will be at 10 a.m., and the parking lot, we'll do a lot more announcements. We'll do it on the all, all, all text, and we'll also be putting this on Facebook and every other way we know how to connect with you. So it'll be 10 a.m., the parking lot service. You'll stay in your cars. Ushers will be there to park you. They'll be outside with masks and gloves. 
Uh, we're going to try to do this on an FM radio station. We'll give you that station. You'll be able to tune in and you'll be able to hear. Now, that's just the people around the church area. We can't FM radio that to the world. We only have a very small transmitter. Um, and if you're not able to be there, do not beat yourself up. Uh, go ahead and stay home. Uh, some of our elderly probably just need to stay home. This is a complicated thing. I was even talking to Eric today who was recovering from knee surgery. He said, you know, if I can sit in the car, I said, measure that out. If you can't sit in that vehicle for that amount of time, then watch on Facebook at home. It is working. This is working. Also, I did want to take a moment to say, uh, Ellis Char uh, Charles, I want to shout out to you. Thank you for your great comments on our video. I've never met you face to face, but I've I've looked at some of your Facebook, and I'm I'm appreciative of your message. So uh, we're brothers, in Jesus name. And then Barbara Fowler wanted to say thank you, Sister Fowler. Um, just it was a treat to uh, to have you text and say thank you. Um, uh, praise the Lord. It's great to hear from you, uh, my neighboring pastor's wife. That's all good thing. And then Sarah and Miles, we didn't get our elements class done today, but we will work on it tomorrow. I wanted to have another one the next day, but it just flat takes a lot of time. So we're going to jump into that. Um, and then this morning's message, uh, by the time I got up here to preach this one, we had 204 views, and those are solid views on our uh, devotion this morning. So if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, go to it. It's pertinent. I'm in a rare mood, and that's a good mood. Um, not 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 a good mood, but one of those a little bit off moods, which you get the best out of me when I'm a little bit whacked out. So uh, just you take that for what you want. But uh, praise the Lord. Let's uh, let's move on from this place um, to the best place, and that is prayer. Let's pray for this service, and then we'll also close for the service. But I've got a I've got a word that I believe is for you today, and it's uh, probably for the world. But but uh, let's let's pray first. And uh, let me, let me, I wish we had feedback because I could just say, hey, are there any prayer requests? So why don't you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I give this to you. Lord Jesus, I give these requests to you. Lord, uh, we know what they are. And, and at this time we speak them out, Lord God. I ask you to meet those needs. There was one need brought to me today. I ask you to touch that. Lord, uh, that you will intervene. And thank you for the faith of Rose today. She was she was talking about faith today. Bless her. Bless her kids. Oh God, is there there at home and so many others? Uh, and we've we've called out their name before. That you will be with all of the folks that go to our church and all those that are listening, and that you will intervene for us. Oh God, we really need a savior to intervene for us. Help us and help our faith remain high and trust in you, God. All of these troubles, you're going to take care of them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Today, somebody called me and had, there was an issue. And uh, it was basically an issue with uh, a checkbook. And I, I told them, you know, hey, let's let's just trust God. Well, why don't you call me back tomorrow? And we'll, we'll pray our way through this thing. And they called me back in about five or six minutes. And the whole thing was fixed. And they were saying, I couldn't believe it. I was reading the March statement and not the April statement. And they looked on the April statement and they had plenty of money. I said, how does that happen? I said, it happens with prayer. Because God, God is great for stealth stuff. He will move behind the scenes. Uh, you know, sometimes he is Jehovah Sneaky. And that is the God who sneaks up on you. The God who, who catches you by surprise. Even when you're having little faith, he's the God who comes forward and gives you great faith. Well, I'm not going to tell you the title of this. It's it's on the screen, but I, I'm not going to tell you the full title yet. I'm going to just read the scripture. So let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th verse. And the first verses I'm going to read are the King James Version. You can look in any version you want. Um, I'm also in the fourth verse once I'm there. Those that know me know I'm going to shift to the ESV. And the reason I did these first ones is because of some specific words they have. Now, Genesis 1, verse 26 and this is King James Version. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now there God gave us dominion over all of these things. Now one thing he didn't do right there, he didn't give us dominion over other humans at this point. 
uh, and that later comes as a father, you know, as a parent. Adam and Eve had children, and as a parent, that kind of dominion, you do have some of that. But this dominion speaks specifically. So I'm not going to try to blend them, and I'm not going to stretch this. I'm just going to say there gave, God gave us dominion, and uh, we lost that dominion. We lost that dominion because of sin. So when we receive the Holy Ghost and we're transformed, there is a renewal of a percentage of that dominion. We now know, and we preach it in Pentecost, that you can say the name of Jesus. That is some of that dominion that's been restored. Now, is it perfect yet? No, it's not perfect. And it's also not perfect because we've interpreted the application of dominion incorrectly in the church. We made some mistakes in our theology. Now, this is really going to shock some people. We've applied it wrong. Uh, we kind of have this let's go hide in the corner mentality. Let's suffer till he comes mentality. Not this let's go out and shine mentality. And that's really what we need to have. This let this power in me. We've preached for years. It's it's the being filled with the spirit, the pneumatos of God, and that God will the pneumatos means the wind, the breath of God. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, that's why you know people even speaking in tongues it takes a wind. I've told people before when you when you're praying and 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 you're reaching out to God, you've got to be talking. Why? Because it is called the breath of God. There's got to be movement across your vocal cords. God doesn't just grab you and shake you. See, when you're not speaking, you're in lockdown mode. Hmm. I'm in control. I got a hold. But that's why we tell people when you're worshiping, say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Let those words of praise come out because that's where God can ride right along your vocal cords and cause you to speak in tongues. I'm not telling you a formula. I'm just trying to give you a picture uh, of, of kind of God pushing you along and allowing you to experience the Spirit. Well, a lot of those things happen now because we've been given that partial dominion, but we just don't step out in it, and we really kind of have missed some things. Well, let's get more into that. Now, the next one is 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? He's asking a question, and matter of fact, it's kind of a sarcastic question. Don't you know this, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And he's trying to get a response from this letter that he wrote. This is Paul who wrote to the Corinthian church, and he's in response to requests that they made. So he's responding to those requests. And he said, don't you understand these things? What's wrong with you guys? And that's going to be the tone of the rest of this message. This idea, snap, wake up. What's wrong with you? There's some things you're missing out on. There's some things that you've just really jumped over and you misapplied them. Wow. To know you have the title to a car and don't even know how to drive it. Come on now. There's some things that we just flat don't know how to apply. Then the next one is this. Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now therefore, no, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Oh, I love it when we talk spirit and then we talk rules. I love them together. To have spirit, there has to be authority. There has to be structure, like I mentioned this morning. So right here it says, keep my covenant. Keep these high-ranking agreements. Um, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the, from all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That you're going to be a holy nation. Now we impose this concept on the church also because we are the spiritual Israel. We're the engrafted ones. Now we're not we're not necessarily all Jews, but we're we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's what it says in the New Testament. I'm reading Old Testament here, but that's what it says in the New Testament. So wow, we're grafted in. And then this last one, Romans 8, 18 through 19. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed in us. Hmm. 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 I just wash my hands just in case you're worried. And uh, my face is washed also. So just when I touch my face. So revealed in us. Hmm. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So creation just holds its breath, and it's waiting for this revealing of something. So something is 
held in secretly. Now, all of these verses together paint a picture. We lost dominion. We have partial uh, uh, restoration of that dominion. Then we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it says, what's wrong with you? Don't you know this? And then it goes on to say, I'm going to separate you as a very special pe people, a priesthood, a royal nation. And then this says, something is waiting to be revealed. Whoa, buddy. I'll tell you what that is. That's like going to your workplace and praying for your car. It's it's not working right. Or you don't have that raise and you proclaim it. I cannot tell you. I've lost track of the number of people that have challenged in our church to proclaim the next step. You know, I'm not unemployed. I'm not the most worthless employee. I am an absolutely incredible employee. What are you doing? Some kind of quacky thing? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm letting you understand that something in you is wanting to be revealed. If you're filled with the Spirit, that something wants to be revealed. And it is potent. Uh, you know, sometimes it does not work to my favor to tell you all the miracles God has done in my life. But I can tell you right now, because it would sound like I was bragging and proclaiming something and all this stuff, I don't really want to do that. What I want to say is stop living in the puddle or in the mud or in the ditch. Why are you doing that? I have looked at so many people over the years and I'm just pulling my hair out sometimes going, why do you do that to yourself? When you could live up here, why do you insist on living down there? And that's where we're going with this. Now, the title of this is basically based on a concept of dominion. Now, let me read the definition of dominion. I had to look a lot of places because there's a lot of enemies to this concept that I'm talking about. There's lots of people that want to make excuse of why the church should be sedate. I, you know, I've just never been that way. I remember there's a couple of pictures of me when we were in one of the old buildings we used to have, and I was there, and I came in. I was in my uniform, and I'm working. I got glue and cleaner. I'm a plumber by trade all over my hands, and I'm there getting ready for a message, much younger model than I am now, and I'm getting ready for the message. I just have never been that kind of pasty tie and suited up guy sitting behind a desk being the pastor. I just never really worked for me. I have to be this guy that's a little looser than that. In other words, just ready to, yeah, I don't know, to maybe to go fix the toilet or something. I just need to be a little bit more close to earth. I can't get that far away from humanity. I need to be in the midst of humans. You know, sheep smell like, you know, shepherds smell like sheep. Now, I'm not saying those other guys aren't the right kind of pastor, because they are. Certain people needs that that pasty white guy, you know, but I'm just not going to be that. I'm going to be that guy that's going to get his hands dirty and that's going to mess up a few words and not too theological. At this point in the game, I'm, I'm pretty well educated, but I'm not going to carry that as a, as a, as a, uh, I've got a doctorate here and I'm not, not liking those guys, but I just feel personally for me, my Holy Ghost, I've got to be down to earth. Okay. Well, the idea where we started was I was going to give you this idea about dominion. Uh, here's what it is. When you are in charge of something or rule it, you have dominion over it. Now, so I have dominion over uh, quite a bit around here. I have an RV outside. I've got dominion over it. My cars, I've got dominion. This house, I have dominion over this house. Uh, because my wife is a, a leader follower and a, a servant follower, She, I have dominion over my wife. Uh, she submits to my authority. Um, then I have dominion over my cats and my dogs. If I have all those and all this stuff around here, praise the Lord, this is my domain. Uh, and then other things are like that, but we won't go into all the detail. But the most famous use of the word occurs in the Christian Bible. When God grants people dominion over other animals, this is an old fashioned and biblical sounding word for having power. Now that's correct. Then here's the, here's the interpretation. A king has dominion over his kingdom. And what we want to talk today is about dominion, and then I'm going to slam you with this next part. Christian exceptionalism. Christian exceptionalism. And I can hardly say the next word, uh, that word, but exceptionalism to where Christians are exceptional. No excuse. I mean, it, it, there was a day and a concept that was around uh, uh, shortly after the time of Christ that if you were a Christian, I know you were under all kinds of uh, uh, persecution and stuff, but there was a time when the, the betterness of the story of Jesus Christ would change things. And it's that same way in the world today. 
the Word of God, the Bible transforms nations. And uh, I've got absolutely book after book of proof of that. That matter of fact, there's a book right up here called Christianity, and, and there's a grouping of those, and there's one down here too that just talk about the fact that Christianity has transformed the known world. And it's still doing it. In those places where there's war and fighting and all kinds of things on a continual basis, band that goes through the middle and those are not christian nations because there's this infighting this this horrific events going on now that doesn't mean christians don't have wars this is not a perfect science i'm talking about and that christians can't be wrong but there's an when there whatever happened to the concept that if you're a christian you should be exceptional somebody told me the other day and i shout out to that person because they're going to know who it is said i've never been fired well praise the lord we shouldn't be fired now uh, there might be a time you're fired but you've got to analyze that why was i fired was it because i was a lousy worker or was it because of something like that i've told the story before about i was sitting in a restaurant and one of the waitresses came up and and she just confided in me about somebody that i knew that was a christian in word and they never tipped and this waitress was just frustrated about it because I was in league with that person and she knew me well. She knew I was a tipper and that I, I cared about people, not just because they're Christian, but I care about people. That's Jesus came back and there was no Christians and he cared about people. So think about the concept. And, and, and well, the idea is this, is that Christian exceptionalism and here's the rest of the story, the lack of it in the church of today. There's a lack of Christian exceptionalism in the, in the church today. And one of the main reasons, I'm going to bring it up in a moment, but I'll tell you quick because I have it on my mind, is that we are lazy and we like to make excuses for our failures. We use the same technique as the world. We make excuses when we don't step up to the base. We make excuses when we show up late. We make excuses when, you know, it's the boss's fault. No, we, we, you know, we go in and says, my boss, I've heard this so many times, my boss won't let me excel. I have it at church all the time. Other preachers, other, other ministers in our church, uh, Brother Hustledge is in the way. He never gave me an opportunity. I have never in my life thought that way. I have always made my own opportunity. I want to just be honest with you. That's who I am. I go out and I make something new. I don't wait. That's what uh, I mentioned the other day. What frustrates me about developers and realtors. Realtors chase the market. Developers make the market. I've always been the kind of guy who's, I'm going to go make a market. I'm a pioneer type pastor. What's wrong with us sometimes when we let everybody else tell us how, how high we can go? You know, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to let somebody, and this is, Jacob, you knew I'm going to preach this, but I'll throw this out. Jacob, I love you. I'll tell you this. That uh, uh, I'm not going to let somebody else determine my value but give me an hourly rate. Nobody's going to ever come to me and tell me, Donnie, you're only worth $15 an hour. Because somewhere in this goofy brain, I'm worth more than that. And I'm going to pursue and make sure that that number is determined by the market. Whatever somebody will pay me. And so the concept is... I'm not going to allow a Holy Ghost filled vessel like this to be determined by the world that you're only valued at this much. No, 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 you got the wrong guy there. When I walk in the door, you're talking five, six hundred bucks an hour. Now, oh my goodness, what an ego. No, no, I just want to tell you that thinking like that has allowed me to step forward and actually be valued at what God values me at. No, I'm not going to sit there and argue with God all day. See, God God refused to say that I was worth $15 an hour. He kept whispering in my ear saying, you're worth more than that. So what did I do? I added value. I showed people that I was worth more. Value added. Wow, what is that? Well, just be careful of that idea when somebody says, you're only worth $10 an hour. Well, you need to prove that wrong. Now, you might need to work at $10 an hour for a while. But after a while, they're going to come to you and say, you know, we got this job over here. I think you'd be good at it. I think you'd be good at it. One of those people, I don't want to call their name, but I remember they were working over at Walmart and uh, they were working their way up and there was a challenge. I made a challenge to him. I said, are you going to work right here in this one division your whole life? And, he, and they said, what can I do? I said, move to the top of your area. So they moved up actually in Walmart to a higher position and it was excited about it. Lo and behold, another job came open in another area and not in Walmart, but in another. And boy, and now they come back to me and say, what? Oh, this is crazy. 
I mean, I cannot believe I'm doing this well. I've got control of my own life. I mean, all of these things. I've seen that repeatedly in people that I have been around over the years. And I can prove an attitude will change things. And I'm trying to tell people, don't let your brain get you stuck. Because God has made you to have dominion. And there's so much more to that. I just can't preach it all. But why is there a lack of it in the church today? Is Christianity superior to other religions? Now, I have done an extensive um, search on Google. And this is one area where I think there would be lists and lists of stuff. But there's a struggle. Uh, there's a lot of people out there uh, not speaking about the fact that Christianity is superior to other religions. There's a few out there, but the majority want to tear it down and say, no, it's not. Matter of fact, other Christian people are telling us uh, on, on <coughs> Google and stuff on, online that we should keep the separation of church and state. Oh my goodness, folks, I never have believed that. I think the church should overwhelm the state and you might call me dominion theology. That's okay. If you want to make excuses for your laziness of doing big fat zero, then you go ahead. You're not going to catch me doing that. I get up every day wanting to fit, hit the ground and let's go do something. Let's go do something to change the kingdom on earth. I'm all about thriving in Babylon. I'm tired of Christians making hundreds and hundreds of excuses constantly every day. Why they don't excel. Why do they don't thrive? We're in Babylon. We should thrive. I'm thriving. I mean, I don't care what's happening now. Think, you know, I'm not cashing in my, my retirement uh, because don't cash in your retirement right now because things have went down. But I have confidence things are going to go back up. Matter of fact, if I don't notice things going up, God's going to put something in my way that catches my notice that I'll say, okay, I'll do that. And all of a sudden, it'll, it'll bring back. I've told you the story before. If I said, Lord, where's my next blessing? I challenge you to do that. Where is my next blessing, Lord? Because God promises blessing. The problem with you probably is you don't know notice it because you're not thinking right. You're all messed up in your head. We need to be superior to other religions. Someone said to me, Christianity is better. It's better sung than said. And I agree with that. It's better sung than said. <laughs> I see Christianity in my house all the time. My wife walks around and she's singing. And I mean, she's just got this connection to the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is there. It's really a cool deal. But she'll start singing and I'll think, there's Christianity right there. It's better sung than said. Because a lot of people want to talk about it, but they don't want to be it or do it. Or they have their little things they check off. I am not going to chase people down with the list of the things that... <clears throat> Uh, that I'm doing that are Christian. I don't need to have a brag sheet and go tell everybody. I get tired of that. People come around, look, I, well, I did this, I did this, I did this. Now, certainly, as a pastor, I do tell people some of the things I do because I want them to be inspired. I'm not there to brag or have this list, but the list is not enough. Have I done enough? Absolutely not. There needs to be more, but the people I'm talking to now are those people that are stuck, and I'm trying to get you unstuck. Religions are not the same and they're not equal. So if you're thinking Islam and all that is equal, it is not equal to Christianity. Your agenda in life, my agenda in life is to prove that Christianity is superior. Not because Jesus needs our help. All we have to do is be a Christian. The problem with us, we know how to say the word, but we don't know how to be the word. <laughs> Amen. And then some religions are morally, theologically, and philosophically superior to others, just like some comp composers and artists are superior to others. You know, a Rembrandt is different than a, a, a Rockwell. Now, a Rockwell, I think I like that more than a Rembrandt, but definitely a Rembrandt's going to bring four or five million dollars, and a Norman Rockwell's going to bring probably a hundred thousand bucks. I think the most expensive one was a million dollars. Now, I think Norman Rockwell is probably better in my life, because he's country. But the thing is, is that there are some that are better than others, just like there's religions that are better than others. And I am absolutely convinced Christianity is better uh, for lots of reasons. And I might get to those today, but what happened to Christian exceptionalism? Why isn't it visible in the church today? Christ is better, but Christianity may not be. Oh, well, that was pretty good. Christ is better, but Christianity, why? Because we're involved, we're involved, and we have this, we have this, you know, this delay mechanism. We don't jump in fully in. We kind of just kind of get involved, and 
a matter of fact, I've heard recently, and, and I, I wish people would stop doing this, stop referring back to what you used to be. It really doesn't look good on you. I'm better now, right now, than I have ever been. <laughs> How do you like that one? I com I'll compete with your, oh, I used to be this. I used to, I said, what are you doing now? Why don't you stop playing the old records and throw those away and start making new records? Amen. Uh, are, you, are you doing it now? Well, I, granted, I don't want to live in the past all the time. I'm not over the hill. I said that when I turned 50, which was three years ago. I did not go over the hill. I'm not doing, and I'm 54, aren't I? Well, I won't get feedback from my wife, but I think I'm a little older than that now. But the overall picture, I think I'm 54. So that was four years ago when I decided that I'm not going to die on this hill. This is not the time for me to be done. This is the time for me to shine better than ever before. Matter of fact, in my 50s, I fasted more than I have ever fasted in my life. In my 50s, I've read more of the Bible than I've ever read in my life. In my 50s, I read more books than I have ever read in my life. And at 50, I'm doing more for God than I have ever done in my life. Fooey on all those 60, 70 year olds who say I'm done and all those 30 and 20 year olds who are referring back to whatever. The idea is what you are now and the problem is, is we represent Christianity so badly. It's scary. We should be the dominant. Amen. I mean, we shouldn't be the ones always having uh, all these financial problems. I understand some of the economy right now. That's very, you have a pass on that. But the overall, uh, overall thing is that we shouldn't be the ones that don't have any kind of good input. We have access to some of the greatest input. Why isn't it visible in the church today? Christ is better, but Christianity may not be. Who hijacked Christianity? Um, there is a church within the church. There is a group that are living for God, shining. There are pillars in the church. There are mature saints. But there's also a group that's not. And the idea is that, does cream rise? Yes, cream rises. Now, somebody told me that way, cream always rises. And they told me I was cream. This is back when I was a young person. And I thought, what are they seeing in me that I don't see? For all those people that get told all the time that people see something in you, why don't you stop arguing with them and start believing them? You know, you don't have to shoot down every compliment. When a compliment comes, say thank you. That's the correct thing to say. Thank you. I mean, perchance somebody is proclaiming something that you don't see that you can step into. I mean, I had a stepdad call me all my life, told me I was stupid. And to the point when I was a teenager, I repeated that and said, I am stupid. But the end result of that, somebody else came in who had the Holy Ghost who said, you're going to be great. And I started believing them and I started repeating them. I'm going to be great. Praise the Lord. And it's not in myself. It's not for my glory. I'm a worker for Jesus Christ. It's for God's glory. And, and I, I mean, the Lord has got to be frustrated sometimes when everybody believes the negative when it's said, and that he can't get you up and over. Somebody the other day uh, mentioned about um, the guy in the scripture who shot the arrows and shot too few. Oh my goodness. I don't want to be that dingbat that shot too few. I want to be the guy who empties the quiver. I mean, that means you're going to have to be awake. And I think sometimes Christianity is not awake. We claim superiority, but we seldom display superiority. Yeah, uh, people have said, you know, Brother Hussey, I mean, you just kind of jump in there and kind of start leading and stuff. Yeah. You know, Brother brother uh, Scoggins once said about me, he said, Brother Hustlers might, by, might not be the leader, but he's going to act like the leader. Well, that's a compliment. Yeah. Every, there was other designated leaders, but when I was there, I'm going to lead. Why? When I find a gap, I step into it. Let's do it. I mean, we need to have a church full of leaders, not just people who sit back and go, feed me, feed me, like a little little bird. And we're going to talk about that, being being a milk eater and not a meat eater. The visible church is full of all kinds of issues. And this is where I was going. Here's this week. Here's what I heard this week. Uh, saying uh, Somebody was saying uh, you're, they're doing something does not equate to doing something. Uh, saying you're doing something does not equate to doing something. People talk about the things they're going to do. I mean, we, we, I, I've walked through the church before and uh, somebody asked me, well, let me be real delicate here because this could be a really 
pitfall. I want to be careful with this. <laughs> what I want to say is that sometimes we'll find ourselves in a place where it says, you know, I'll take care of that. I'll do that. Be careful what you said because somebody was listening. I went to another leader and I said, why don't you use so-and-so? He says, because I can't get anything out of them. There are a lot of talk and there's no lot of do. Don't you ever be a person that's a lot of talk and not a lot of do. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that spend more timing talking about it and not doing it. That I've heard even recently. And here's, here's another one I heard. And uh, no follow through. Not just saying things, but being a doer. You know the world sees that? That you're, this person was like, yeah, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to do it. But they just had no follow through. And then other people came up and, uh, you know, I, I told them before, went up and said, why don't you use so-and-so to get that done? I said, I'm not going to use him. I said, why? Uh, he, he just can't get it done. They're just not a doer. We need to be a people that do it, uh, uh, not just talk about it. Uh, we just need to be a doer. Uh, <laughs> this happened today, and it is kind of funny. But uh, I called somebody. They gave us a good idea to do something, and I called them. I said, did you get it done? And they, they had kind of tried. And, you know, you can get in that spot where you try, and then as soon as you get resistance, you back up. That is not the church. <laughs> that is not the church. I failed my master plumbing license. Now I did come home and thank God for godly parents and good parents because I was whiny and wanted some sympathy from my dad. And my dad, first thing he said to me, he says, I hope you signed up to take it again. Well, I kind of cut my mouth shut and I went to the phone and I called and I registered to take it again. You know, I was about to back down from that battle. Thank the Lord my dad didn't let me. I jumped in and tore into that battle. And I got my master's license. Made millions of dollars with plumbing. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Millions of dollars. Think about it. All the things you backed away from when you should have just taken into it and tore it to shreds because that was the answer. Amen. I mean, AJ, you went from a janitor to a tradesman, uh, to, a, to a journeyman, to a, a, to a, a, a overseer. Whoa, man. You got it. You got the message. You got the idea. Now let's present the gospel the best we can. The problem is in the church, and there should not be here. We should not be those who say we're doing something and don't do it. Well, that person, and this is no reflection on them, that I call, I, they ran into some resistance, so they were waiting. They didn't know what was going on behind this scene, but they gave the task, the same dream to another person, and they took care of it right away. The problem is we don't rush for, I mean, we're just so lazy for God. Okay, God, you told me to do this. I've told the story hundreds of times. Here it is again. I um, left college with a friend of mine. We left college, and uh, we went on to Alaska, did a work, won, you know, probably about 50 people to the Lord, and, and also established a work and worked in different ministries. Then we came back 10 years later, and I met them, and I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm still waiting for the will of God. And I looked at him and thought, man, I've been up there doing that. And I wasn't really comparing, but it's hard not to compare on that and just go, wow, man, what a deadbeat. <laughs> the Lord's tired of deadbeats. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's tired of deadbeats. How can he build the kingdom with a bunch of deadbeats? How can he build pillars when the pillars turn to jello? I mean, that's what we find in the church today. We get a, we get a team together and that team just flops. Two or three people stay standing because we're trying to, I mean, we got people who don't come to church. They call in sick all the time, all these kind of things. Let me not spend too much time there. But the overall picture is shame on you. Shame on you. I'll say it again. Shame on you for not carrying the load. Jesus Christ carried the cross to Golgotha. Shame on you when you're just limp-wristed and fall over at just the slightest wind. It drives me flat crazy. I'm glad for this opportunity to at least say it. Oh, my goodness. There's a great uh, song on YouTube. You ought to look it up. It's by Patty Larkin. I finally found it. And some of you are going to know what I'm talking about. I used to talk about the, the song, um, Me, 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 I, 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 Me, 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 I, I, I. This is her song, Patty Larkin. And the whole song is about her. And it's a very funny song because it's just all about her. She's not looking at anybody else. The only person she's looking at in the, in the mirror is herself. And that's another problem with Christianity. Some of us Christians make a big fuss about us. 
I don't see Jesus doing that now. Oh, this might be a little rough today, and you might think I'm speaking from a tower. But no, I have all of these conversations with myself first. I'm not sitting in a tower saying, you don't have a right to feel bad. I gotcha, I gotcha. There's plenty of room to be human, but let's not that human room be the overwhelming room. You know, we get in that spot today that just gets kind of weird. And Gandhi said this. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a total fan of Gandhi. He was not a Christian. But he said, live like Jesus and the world will listen. Sometimes people aren't listening. Hear this out, folks. Because you're not really being the example you could be. Here's another quote by him. Jesus I was ideal, but you Christians are not that much like him. Now, that's a very famous quote by him. He said, I'd be a Christian if it weren't for the, I'd be, I'd be, I'd follow Christ if it weren't for the Christians. And that's the problem. Sometimes we come forward and we really need to examine ourselves. I mean, if, if everything you do is offensive, then why don't you pull back on being offensive? And it's also nice, this, is to admit that you're offensive. I mean, I, you know, I'm trying desperately to check myself out to go, okay, I know I've got to be somewhat offensive because if you don't smack them, you know, Jesus is going to offend you or, or, or you're going to serve them, one or the other. So I'm going to have to be somewhat of that tool. But overall, you need to examine yourself and be the best you can be. Amen. I'm just tired of Christians having the excuse of, I only made it this far because this is as far as God gave me strength to make it. And I'm a failure, and, and the failure reflects badly on Jesus Christ. Don't be that kind of person. Now, I will tell you this, and I've said it many a time. If you find something you're not good at, change it what you're doing. And that doesn't include being married, okay? If you're married, you need to stay married, but you need to get good at being married. But there's other things. If you're not a good carpenter, you can be a good whatever, gardener. I've known lots of people that have changed their trades and position, but they're constantly trying, and it's the attitude, not the, not the work they do. It's the attitude about it that makes a difference. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, and this is in regard to a statement that was made to me, and I'll tell you the statement in a minute, but it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Okay, so the person living for God can be equipped. There's scripture, the scripture. Now, this statement was made to me. Someone looked at me and they said, Pastor, it is is obligated. The pastor is obligated to correct and direct. And here's my statement to that. What do you what do you do when people don't listen? When they're not actually listening? We've had people come to our church for years that just aren't listening. They like coming to the church. It's a nice place. The people are nice. They made it into a social event. I mean, I'm not trying to make it into a social event. I want to have social events to make it somewhat enjoyable like that and to have that camaraderie. I'm really all about family and loving one another. But there's a there's this part about shepherding. Now, I'm not sure they're that, that person who said that statement about pastor. They wanted the pastor to fix everything. Well, really, it goes back to the scripture. The scripture is profitable. So, I, and I'm not a pastor that uses the scripture to beat you. I'm a pastor who comes forward and gives you the verses for you to ruminate on. Why do you think I tell everybody to read and to get into the word of God and to study? I tell you to. Why? Because your soul is at risk. You know, you seek out your own salvation, not the pastor gives you salvation. Some of you are going to be lost and uh, just absolutely lost. You're sitting in the church and you're going to be lost because you got no fire. You've got no purpose. You've got no wow about you. I'm going to tell you, a Christian ought to have some wow about them. My last job, I was there. I came in. They, they said um, they were going to pay me 17 bucks an hour. I said, praise the Lord. I was a master plumber. Oh, my own company. They said, are you sure you're going to work for 17 hours? $17 an hour? I said, absolutely, I'll work for $17 an hour. They were shocked. Well, they made a, uh, they had a talk, and they said, there's no way we can hire this guy for 17 bucks an hour. So they came to me, and they offered me a salary, this bigger number, uh, probably, who knows, 22, 25, whatever, something like that. And I don't mean that light. I just, I'm used to making money. So I went and took the job, and the next thing you know, they gave me a raise, and then they gave me another raise. And then the third year, they gave me the largest raise in the company's history. 
They gave me a $10,000 raise after being there three years. And I looked at them. It's funny. I worked for them for a whole year under that and all this. It was incredible. The idea, though, is that it's like a buck and bronco. You're inside this cell and you're going, listen, I'm going to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to proclaim the greatness of God. Everything I do is going to show the workmanship of Jesus Christ. I am here to manifest the glory of God in this present world. That is my purpose in life. And it's not just my purpose. It's God's calling to you. He placed the spirit of God in you to transform this present world. Stop being a black hole. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stop being that negative and that, oh, this is going to get me. I, I mean, this is a little scary. If you, if you chain me up inside of a house, this is how I get. I get just rambunctious, ready for the power of God to move, uh, ready to, you know, either even see the eastern sky open up and Jesus Christ come and us just have powerful, overwhelming revival. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. So that, that's a good thing. But it's the scripture that changes you. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 3 and 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready. You're not yet ready. And that's the truth. Sometimes, I mean, the thing is, we've really got to analyze ourselves. It says, am I ready for strong meat? Am I ready to be fed? And that's the truth. Now, here's what a, here's what a grown-up Christian does. A grown-up Christian's got their act together. They're not, I mean, in other words, they... They, they work to kind of control their finances. They, they try to look at the future. Uh, they give offerings. Uh, they give, they tithe. Uh, matter of fact, they, they, you're pretty serious about tithing out of their first fruits, not their last fruits, but the first fruits. Those guys that get caught every couple of weeks and they're not, you know, the, oh, I forgot to tithe, I'll catch up next month. That's not a mature Christian. Uh, that person that's not at church regularly, that's not a mature Christian. That person who does not have a, to pray until you feel the presence of God, that person's not a mature Christian. And, you know, we can't really operate the church with a lot of, uh, of that weakness going on. And I don't know if you want to stay there or not. We understand when you're a new convert that there's a time of growth. But once you've gotten your legs under you and you can do a few things, a great one at this, and I'm going to I'll brag on her all day long, is Courtney. Oh, my goodness, Courtney. Uh, Courtney Coda. Um, but you have you have shown your colors, girl. I mean, I I've seen that. I you have you've taken a, a calling list and you call folks and you're loving them and you're caring about them. In other words, it's kind of crazy. You took those people and made them yours and you started to love them. Kudos to you. Oh, that's amazing. That's Christianity. <laughs> that is Christianity. Uh, there's others in our church. I, I told somebody of a need the other day and they said I'll pay for it. <laughs> you know, I was just like okay. I mean, they didn't just pay for it. I think it was $1,300. They just took care of it. Wow. Out of the abundance of their heart, they jumped in there. The other day, I was talking to somebody who doesn't even go to our church. And they, I said, we working on this need. He says, I'll donate $1,000. And I thought, Whoa, that was crazy. I thought, wow, this abundance of people jumping forward. And I invite you to be part of this. I invite you to be part of this. Here's another one, Hebrews 5 and 12. And I know I've been going long here. But I'll try to button this up in the next five minutes. Uh, Hebrews 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, should you have been teachers by now? Should you have been somebody that was not, not just teaching a Bible study, but nurturing somebody on? You know, if you're, if you're a tree, are there any fruit hanging from you? Any people hanging from you? You know, every day I got people calling me, and I know I'm the pastor, but... Really and truly, we ought to have little mini pastors that are connected with so many people. Have you taken anybody on as a responsibility to keep them saved? There's people that are struggling on the edge. Have you reached out to them? I mean, I, I, I brag always about Sherry and Eric, and I don't have time to brag about everybody. I can brag about all of our uh, upper leadership at our church, and especially our, our very mature saints. But it's not uncommon for me to hear about Sherry being connected to somebody. I'll go to somebody and, and they'll say, well, Sherry just called me. and Or yeah, actually, even truly, it'll be Eric or John Ortega called or, or Don or anybody. It'll be in this network of people calling each other and caring for each other. And that really goes for so many uh, in our church. And I, I really don't want to get into the mess of naming everybody. But it is so many people in our church are like that. It goes on to say that... You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Do you, do you know how to pray? 
I mean, I've got to ask some people that have been going to our church for years. I mean, do you even pray? I mean, uh, are you, are you, are you, you know, I'm, I'm probably, don't apply any of this to you. I'm just throwing this out as a blanket. I'm not here to pick on anybody or make you bad. But if today, if I poke you, then you just need to, don't get mad at me. Just go back and say, Lord, do I need to improve in that area? You know, I've already I've already preached this message to me. I've already been barbecued and beat up and a meat grinder and all that type of stuff. But what I'm saying is that you need to go back and say, okay, does this apply to me, Lord? I mean, should you already have been teachers? Should you have been somebody in the church that was doing something? The basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their power and discernment trained by constant practice, constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Have you dropped the ball? Have you let go of something that you shouldn't have let go? Did you promise God something and you never gave it another thought? Those things will kill you. The scripture says he'll let you do what you want to do, but along with it will come a wasting disease. That's uh, Psalms 106 down through the verses. They did what he, they gave, God gave them a blessing, but along with it came a wasting disease and that wasting disease caused them to be ill and waste away and never really get up on, have you been struggling and trying to get on top of things, but you just can't quite get there? Well, sometimes it comes to that place where you're just flat and doing it all wrong. You're applying it all wrong. You need to go back to the basis, basics. Get on your knees before God, ask God, to forgive you of your wasteful activities, your laziness. And truly, it, it appalls me that when I find liars in the house of God, people who say I'm going to do it, don't do it, give it no thought. It's the house of God. It doesn't really matter. That's That frightens me. When you say you're going to do something in the house of God, you're going to take care of something. You better make that your first agenda because God's always going to know you really didn't care about my stuff. That's what happened with Solomon. Didn't really care. And I'm not here to give a guilt trip. I'm just here to wake up the church and let you know that God's given us dominion. I want you to live in newness of life. There's a whole army of people in our church that are living that way. But for some reason, there are people that have chosen not to because I hadn't been pushy enough. Maybe I haven't been loud enough. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. But what I want to do is proclaim it. Let me read this in, in, in final. Milk drinkers are a liability but are designed to be a future asset, a future help, not a burden. They are to transition to meat. They are not given responsibility. Granted, I have given some milk drinkers responsibility. I want to see them get up, but sometimes they don't. Meat, meat eaters are the spokes in the wheel. They are definitely needed. Milk drinkers ride while meat eaters push. Milk is temporary. Meat is Meet us till death do us part, or we go in the rapture. I love that. We got some folks that will be at our church forever. I mean, even when I mess up, they're forgiving. They they don't get offended with me very easily. Or they come to me, they talk to me, or they outlast me, one or the other. But they're going to be there, and they're going to serve God like nobody's business. Milk drinkers play around in the house. Meat eaters are out in the field working. Milk drinkers are cutting teeth while meat eaters are cutting the harvest. Milk drinkers wear diapers while meat eaters have to change them, and it's a shame. Milk drinkers have to be provided for. Meat eaters provide. Prolonged milk drinker, drinking will produce whiners and not warriors. Milk drinkers wear bibs while meat eaters wear breastplates. Milk drinkers swing plastic swords while meat eaters weld steel. Milk drinkers can't produce but, but can become meat eaters. It is meat eaters who produce the milk drinkers who are the future generation of meat eaters. And that's the truth. Milk drinkers play in, with matches while meat eaters extinguish the blaze. Milk drinkers are relegated to the barracks while meat eaters are regimented to the trenches. Milk is only a means to an end. Meat is the only means to stand in the end. It's time for us to represent well. And I want to tell you, Christianity is superior. It is. Now, I might not be on the outside the guy who, certainly now, not being able to see my barber, barber have a perfect haircut, 
and everything is the right color and everything's perfect. And I'm tie and shoes and all that just perfectly. But don't get me wrong. Inside of here is a guy who sees that God has a plan. And you don't have to have it all perfect, but you better have your act together. That needs to be the impression people get when they get around you. That person's got their act together. And the reason why is because they are devoted to the superiority of Christianity, the exceptionalism of Christianity. Can you prove that Christianity is exceptional by your life? I will prove to you by my checkbook, by my family, how they carry themselves, by the church that I go to, by the business that I run, that God is exceptional. And I challenge you, I challenge you, stop trying to prove otherwise. The best thing to do is step forward and say, God, use me, use me. Let there be a, let there be a, 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 a statement, a, a, a colon, well, not a colon, but an apostrophe. Let there be an apostrophe with me. And if you're not there and you don't feel it, let's just go in prayer to God and we're going to ask God to help us. Lord Jesus, I've come before you many times before and I've just said this, use me, Lord, to give you glory. And I challenge our church to pray that prayer. Use me, Lord, to give you glory. Lord, I'm not seeking praise and I'm not seeking all the flattery, Lord God, but I am seeking performance of the superiority of the Christian faith. Be in me, Lord, showing the world, Jesus Christ. Be in me, Lord, showing the world your glory, your structure, your faithfulness, O God. And I will serve you well, Lord. I will serve you to the best of my ability, God, so that your name can be proclaimed forever, forever. And in me, have trust and have faith in the church, in God, in the Lord, in the word of God. Get into the word and allow God to manifest his glory in your life and change you forever. Well, I trust today has been good for you. I hope I didn't beat you up enough. I just want you to know that there's more out there than you even see. You cannot comprehend what God wants to do with one little old person, and that's you. You need to start believing it. In Jesus' name, God bless you.